So it's July 9th, and while I was making this video, there was a really interesting news article come up. The courts said that President Trump is not allowed to block individuals from reading his Twitter feed. It basically says that if a public official uses Twitter as a means of disseminating information, as a means of giving out information, then it violates the First Amendment if people are blocked from participating in the discussion. Isn't that interesting? So the First Amendment here is being used to say that people have the right to communicate. Now, this comes down to the concept of a, a public square. And then many different countries have this concept that, that uh, if you have a forum where people are allowed to present, for example, magazines or uh, a public square. You know, back in the old days, there would be like, you know, the town park and people would go to the town park and they would have discussions. People would stand up on soapboxes and give speeches. Well, if a person is prohibited from participating in those public speeches, then it violates the First Amendment. And right now it's limited to, you know, public officials can't block people. But it's kind of an interesting thought because Twitter has become the public square. And there are many people in the past, I guess, 18 months that have been blocked from participating in this discussion. And from my perspective, I think that's a really bad thing. It's, is it constitutionally right or wrong? I don't know. I think that's something the that courts have to uphold. But from my perspective, the more free speech we have, the better off we are as a society on the whole. If people can have their disagreements in public and everyone gets a say, even if we disagree, it's okay to disagree. The real danger is when people aren't given the right to talk. So the Constitution is working on a daily basis. We talked a lot about who you are. Because when we spoke, and this is the first when you first came, you kept saying things like, oh, I'm 20% English, or I'm, you know, part Scottish, or, or whatever. Uh, and I want to point out that it doesn't make any sense. You're 100% you. And what does it even mean to be 20% English? When I look at an Englishman and a Scotsman, they look exactly the same. And you know what's more? If you say someone's from wherever, Germany, you say, oh, okay. What does that mean? I mean, Germany, it was, it was, uh, uh, the land of Germany was inhabited by the Franks, which eventually became French. It was inhabited by uh, uh, Germanic tribes. It was inhabited by Romans, which, you know, are the Italians. So at what point in history do you put the little flag and say, okay, you know, a German is a person from, you know, 1600 AD. And whoever was living there in 1600 AD, that makes him a German. Right? You can't really say that. And what's more, all people really come from the same place. And so that doesn't make sense. And, and what's more, let, let's, let's think about the most English person in the world. Who's the most English person on the planet right now? The Queen of England. That's right. By definition, she's the most English person. Do you know what her family historical name was? She's from the Habsburg Empire. She's a true-blooded German. Like, so there's this woman, you know, 100% German, if you look at her heritage, that we could look at as the most English person on the planet. It doesn't make any sense. When you say who you are, you are 100% you. And you have to live your life being 100% you. You know, it's something that, uh, you know, the statement, you know, you know, your family tree is a stump. 
it's how you have to live. Being successful is about not looking at the past and not pining for the future. Uh, this was this was uh, uh, something that Frederick Nietzsche pointed out that that uh, the way to live a life is living in the present and accepting the past and accepting the future, both of those as, as fate. Uh, there's this amor fati to love one's fate. That's a really important concept in philosophy, and it was part of Stoicism, and uh, it's threaded all through the philosophies of the successful people in history. And they may not have actually studied philosophy to know what they were talking about, but nonetheless, they believed it. The, uh, the founding fathers of the U.S., they were not looking at their history. They were not even looking at the future. They were looking at where they are right now and what they wanted for a government. And as you live your life, that's what you should be doing. So another amendment to the Constitution, which is really important, is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment says the government uh, shall not take away citizens' freedom to bear arms, to carry weapons. And that's important because we're supposed to have weapons on the off chance that the government, that the people holding the office of government, so remember I we talked about the people, there's the office of the president, and then there's the people holding the office, well, if people holding the office become tyrants, if they abuse their power, then we, the citizens, have not just a right, but a responsibility to remove them from power. And that requires having weapons. And I know that it sounds, a lot of people think that's a terrible thing. Because, oh, we need to have, you know, no guns except for the police. It's like, well... Do you really trust giving all of the guns to the police and the military and then the rest of us just kind of sit there? And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-police or anti-military, anti but I recognize that if you concentrate all the power in the hands of you know, just the police, well, that's called a police state. And we don't want that. And that's why it's important that people be allowed to have weapons. Uh, now, this is the right to bear arms. It's not the right to fire arms, and that's different. So if you're a citizen and you obey the laws as best you can, you have the right to carry a weapon. As soon as you pull the trigger, now you're subject to laws about, did you fire it correctly, right? For example, you're not allowed to shoot a gun inside city limits. And if you do shoot a gun in city limits, now all of a sudden you have to stand trial on did you fire it in a just fashion? So some cases firing a gun is just. If you're defending your life, your family's life, your family's liberty, yeah, that's just. But it can only be deemed just by seeing a judge and having a judge listen to the case and then saying, yeah, it was, it's just, or maybe let's say, no, it's unjust. For example, someone breaks into your house and you shoot them. Well, perhaps that person, you could have run away or you could have hidden or they're some small, weak person and you didn't have to shoot them, but you did anyhow. Well, that's unjust. So the second amendment says, Everyone has the right to carry weapons. Shooting them is different. And as soon as you shoot a gun, then you're subject to the laws and judgment by our Justice Department. So we, as Americans, we like guns. We carry guns. We 
use guns to protect ourselves. We use guns to protect our families. We use guns for lots of stuff. We use guns just because they're fun to shoot at the shooting range. But we don't like taking life, and it's not right to take life unless you absolutely have to. And our Constitution says that, that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And none of these shall be taken away without due process. So if you take away someone's life without due process, or the government takes away someone's life without due process, then they're subject to judgment based on the laws of the land. So the Second Amendment is very important as well. We talked about creme brulee. It's basically a custard. Egg yolk, dairy, sugar. The sugar's for flavoring. So in fact, if you didn't have any sugar, you just had the egg yolk and some heavy cream, you can make a great creme brulee. It would not be so sweet, but it would still have that custard appeal. And afterwards, we put sugar on top and we melt it with a torch. Melting with the torch does two things. It browns the sugar and it adds a uh, kind of glassy, amorphous layer. Creme brulee is great. As long as we're on the subject of genealogy, genealogy and family history, I think it's also worth commenting that I try to avoid it, not just because I don't believe it's important, because it's not, but there are a lot of people that don't have a family history and they don't have the genealogy. There's people that you know, were adopted. Uh, there's people whose families were, were slaves. And when we look back at our genetics and we say, oh, you know, my great, great, great grandfather came here on the, you know, the, you know, Smith Winston yacht and da da da. That's something that we have, but many others don't. Or many other people say, oh yeah, my great, great, great grandfather, you know, was beaten in Africa, thrown on a boat and, and brought to the US. And we don't really know anything else. And while I'm, I'm not a big social justice warrior type person, thankfully, I do recognize that the concepts like, you know, that history and that continuity is unique to a very small subset of the population. You know, even, even if you look at other places, like you, you look at the Middle East, uh, there were tribes that were going back and forth and back and forth for forever. People didn't have a stability that, that, that we have. And that's another reason that I, I try to avoid it because I think it's, it's a little bit insulting to to brag about having a uh, heritage when first off it's probably false and I'll, I'll tell you, you you listen to the family stories and mythologies a lot of it's made up so we have this false heritage and then we brag about a false heritage and other people they don't even have a false heritage that they can brag about We talked about the Third Amendment to the Constitution. And I didn't call it the Third Amendment, but I just said that the government is not allowed to store soldiers in your house. And what I mean by that is they can't say, hey, you have a house, we need soldiers to, to live, so they're gonna live in your house. And it sounds like a really weird amendment, uh, but King George, who we fought against in the Revolutionary War, uh, was storing British soldiers in American houses. And that's what it, it says. That, that's why the government is forbidden from doing that. And it was worth commenting on our, our revolution and our fighting was not against the English or the British. It was against the king and the rule of the king. And in fact, you know, the British people and the American people are, are great friends. Uh, you know, we're kind of siblings, kind of like we're brother and sister countries. Uh, 
and it was the king that we fought against. And the Third Amendment says that the, the king or our government can't put soldiers in your house during a time of peace. We also talked in very general terms about the concept of Jungian dream interpretation. So Carl Jung was a psychologist and he talked a lot about how dreams are insight to our subconscious. All the things that, that our conscious mind really can't access, well, they come about while we're having dreams and we can use dreams as, as a way to gain insight to what's inside our head that we can't see directly. On the topic of your body, we talked a lot about like, your immune system. You know, we, we, in the past, we talked about viruses and bacteria and all that, and you know how you can get sick and why it's important to wash your hands. And it is important to wash your hands as a means of staying clean, but don't think about it too much. Wash your hands before you eat. You know, you drop food on the floor, you don't eat it, right? The rest is all about having a good immune system. And the way you have a good immune system is you eat foods that are healthy, you get exercise, you drink plenty of water, and you get plenty of sleep. And if you do those things, you just do normal healthy things like exercise, drink water, eat, sleep, then your immune system will really take care of you. And I, I don't do a great job at all those things, but, uh, I, I try as, as best I can. Uh, we talked about drinking water too, because your body is always making poisons or toxins. I wouldn't call it poison. But when you exercise, for example, your muscles are taking in uh, glucose and oxygen, and they're producing uh, acids and they're producing uh, salts and all these things that are, are waste products, right? Everything, everyone poops, right? Well, your muscles, they do too. Your muscles are constantly producing waste. And your organs, so your liver and your, your kidneys and your, you know, even your eyes. I'm sure your eyes, they're taking in oxygen and they are giving off waste products. Well, those all come out of your body through your urine. And that's why it's important that you keep drinking water because it allows your body to flush all those out. So every day at work, I drink two liters of water because I have uh, plastic bottles. And first thing in the morning, I fill them up. And while I'm sitting at my desk working, I drink water. And that's what everyone should do. Everyone should drink, you know, between two to four liters of water per day. And that's it's just a good habit. It keeps your immune system healthy. It keeps your body healthy. We talked about search and seizure. We said the government cannot search your property or search your body or seize your property uh, without a warrant. And this is the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. So, for example, you're walking on the street and a policeman says, I want to see what's in your pockets. You can very politely say and be polite because the police deserve respect. You say, I'm sorry, officer, but the Fourth Amendment says you can't look in my pockets unless you have a warrant. Because that's how it is. And what's more, if you're carrying something in your hand, they can't take it away from you unless there's reason for it. Like, for example, you're, you're walking down the street and you've got, you know, a burning piece of wood. And then, you know, there may be a, a rule that says, you know, you can't carry burning wood. On, on the street, which makes sense, doesn't it, right? It could be a fire hazard. And then they can take it away. But they can't just say, you know, no, I, 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 I want that uh, phone. I can take it from you. And in much the same way, they can't, you know, open your phone and read what's in your phone without a warrant. Now, these warrants, they're issued by a judge, and they have to be very narrow. So, for example, a police officer, you know, comes to my house and says, I have a warrant to search your house. And I say, well, can I see the warrant? Well, the warrant will have to say, what is he looking for? And where is he looking? And if the police officer searches my house using the warrant, 
and he finds something illegal that's not listed in the warrant, they're not allowed to act on that. So the Fourth Amendment protects you from basically having the police or the government randomly search you whenever they feel like. And there's a lot of controversy about this because like there'll be roadblocks and the you know, police will stop you and they'll say, you know, we want to know who's in your car. It's like, are you searching my car? So there's, there's some open question now about, about uh, where those limits are. But the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution protects you from unlawful search and seizures. We also talked about replying to messages and, and sending letters to people. Like, for example, when your mother would leave a voice message, I said it's important you write back to her because she was sending you the message because she wanted to hear from you. And it's really helpful for those of us that are, you know, sending you messages to be able to hear back because, you know, we, we do send messages because we, we miss you and we'd, we'd like to, to hear something back. And I, I know you say that, you know, if you write back, then they'll write back to you and you write back to them and it just goes on and on and on. And the easiest way to, to stop the conversation is to just stop replying. And that, that, that is it's not untrue, <laughs> but it's, it's really not the way that we should be doing things. We talked a little bit about the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the Fifth Amendment actually has a lot in it because uh, they talk about things like, you know, what a grand jury is and they talk about uh, double jeopardy and all that. I mean, we didn't talk about that, but we talked about uh, the right to not self-incriminate. So what this is, it says that you can't be asked to say if you did something wrong. Example. You get pulled over by a police officer and the police officer says, were you speeding? And were you, were you not? doesn't matter. What matters is that you don't have to say if you were speeding. And again, very politely, because police deserve respect because they do a really hard job. You very politely say, I'm sorry, officer, but the Fifth Amendment says I don't have to uh, say if I did something wrong. And that's a lot of the Fifth Amendment. You know, other parts have to do with the fact you can't be tried twice for the same, for the same crime. And it, it talks about how uh, my alarm goes off again. It talks about uh, how uh, a grand jury, which is a jury of citizens, uh, can indict people and, and bring them into court uh, for, for crimes. But... Uh, we didn't talk about that, and you'll, you'll learn about that when you get older. We drank Gatorade after exercising. And we also split a Gatorade that night you woke up with leg cramps. And the reason is that Gatorade contains sodium and potassium, and basically it's sodium, potassium, and sugar. Now, when you sweat and exercise, you lose both sodium and potassium. Uh, potassium uh, is important for uh, muscle cramping. So that's why we drank it. Now, it has sugar in it. This one bottle is considered one serving and it contains 80 calories. Those 80 calories are pretty much 100% sugar. Is that good for you? Not really. Is it bad for you? Well, Kinda, sorta. If you drank Gatorade all day, every day, instead of water, yeah, it's bad. You're supposed to be drinking water. But after exercising, getting 80 calories in sugar, it's not that bad. So remember, we drank Gatorade after you'd spend like two hours bouncing or, you know, an hour climbing uh, at the climbing gym. Then it totally makes sense. There's nothing wrong with that. The only problem is when you don't do exercise and you drink it, then it's it's a, a not a great thing for you because basically you're getting all these empty calories and, of course, potassium and sodium, which you just pee out because, hey, you didn't sweat it out. And uh, then it's not so good. But things like Gatorade are okay 
when you're exercising or when you're having problems with things like leg cramps. And in, in fact, I had leg cramps in, in uh, 2015, really bad for a while. So for me, uh, I was drinking Gatorade in the, in the uh, evening right before going to sleep because it, it uh, helped me sleep through the night without getting cramps in my legs. So we had tortillas. And in fact, we had these tortillas. These are the ones that I made on the stove, right? Because they're raw tortillas and you basically put them on the stove for like two or three minutes and then they come out you know, puffy and toasted and good. Well, tortillas, remember, they're like Mexican flatbread, but every culture has a flatbread, right? Uh, for example, in, in China, they got mushu, which is, you know, little, little, uh, well, tortillas, little flat, flat bread that they put, they put uh, food on. Mexico, they got tortillas. Uh, the you know, the uh, Mediterranean region, they've got pitas. So, regardless of, of what you're eating, if you put it on flat bread, someone's probably done something very similar to that in the past, and they just have a different name for it. But it's all basically the same stuff, and it's great because you can use it to eat hummus or sausage or, you know, uh, duck with plum sauce. So we didn't talk about uh, six, seven, and eight amendments on this trip, but we did talk about the ninth and the tenth indirectly. The, the ninth amendment says that any right uh, not listed is still a right. I mean, basically, it's saying that the government can't come in and trample you. And the the uh, Tenth Amendment says that uh, the federal government only has the power given to it by the Constitution. And all other uh, rights are those of the individual and those of the state. So Ninth and Tenth are kind of tied together. It says the federal government is limited to only having the powers granted to it through the Constitution. And the rest are the powers of the people and the citizens. Uh, and that, that, that's important, and it's, it's something that I think people lose sight of. And this also ties into our idea of positive and negative liberty, right? Negative liberty says, you know, the government can't do anything, and that's what the Ninth and Tenth Amendments were supposed to protect us from. They're supposed to say, government can't do except what we say it does in this document and all the rest. No, it's all up to the individual or to the individual states. And that, in my opinion, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, the foundation of those are what makes America great. And those are ensured through the you know first and second amendments in particular but all the other amendments are designed to protect that the principles of the ninth and the tenth that the government is only allowed to have the powers that we give it in the constitution what do we learn about hair care we learn conditioner is important not just conditioner but daily conditioner is important particularly if you have long hair that is thin and apt to tangle. You don't need shampoo every day. And in fact, your dad has not used shampoo in over six months. I do, however, every single day, stimulate my scalp using a brush. Shampoo seems to aggravate my uh, dandruff. And it does that for many people. I'm sorry to say that's just how it is. Uh, but cleaning my hair involves using water and scrubbing my scalp in order to uh, remove excess oil from the scalp. I then put in conditioner. I like this one. I've had other brands that I've tried and it keeps my hair from tangling. When it comes to extra conditioner. For example, you want to have uh, your hair have a little bit of body, a little bit of style. You put in a leave-in conditioner. This is what I use. It's what I used on your hair. It worked pretty well. I'm told that a spray-in conditioner is better, 
and I, I might be trying to ex experiment with that some, but the important thing is that on a daily basis you have to take care of your hair. If you don't, then over time you're eventually going to wind up with a problem where you've got big knots in your hair. So daily hair care with water, scalp stimulation, and at least conditioner, backwards, at least conditioner, if not shampoo, is pretty important. Another thing we talked about kind of briefly on the last day was we, we talked about religion again. And we talked about that there's all these different religions and everyone kind of has a different concept of, of what God should be. And, and these different religions are not necessarily compatible with each other. You know, they all have different views and, and uh, strong disagreements. Um, we talked about uh, Christianity and, and you said that you thought that was a pretty good religion and uh, I think Jesus has quite good teachings. And we talked about uh, the death of Jesus and, and how the death of Jesus is actually something very positive. In the story, the death of Jesus, you know, it was sad that he died, but it was happy because it was the end of uh, Jesus' mission on earth. So the, the idea is, is that it was the final step, the final phase, the final phase in, in uh, Jesus's, you know, coming to earth and, and talking with people and uh, then uh, dying. And it was necessary for Easter, which happened three days later when Jesus rises from the dead. And we also went back and we, we talked about praying again. So we asked him, you know, to remind you how, how uh, Jesus taught people to pray. So he had this Lord's Prayer, and there's, there's lots of words in it, but I just wanted to remind you that, that you know, the basics was, you know, Dear God, you're great, thank you. Please give me what I need to make it through the day. Please forgive me for the things that I've done that are wrong. And help me to forgive those that have done things that are wrong against me. And help me to not do wrong things anymore. Uh, thank you for everything. Amen. Yeah, that's the, the short version. You can put different words and, and whatnot. But this is, is what Jesus said is the right way uh, to pray when you're praying to God. And we didn't, we didn't talk about religion much on this trip. We talked much more in the past, but uh, this is what we talked about summer 2019.